is your role in the sale of the Los Angeles Dodgers to Guggenheim Baseball Management? I, I'm with, I'm a partner at Foley and Lardner. I'm the co-chair of our sports practice and I led our deal team in, throughout the transaction. What were the key factors that drove the price of the Dodgers? This was a unique sale. You had uh, the media, the, the potential media transaction that's coming and, and is anticipated. Uh, the market, the market's tremendous. It's a huge market. It is a premier franchise. I mean, the Dodgers were in a large fran in a large market here in, in Brooklyn, and they went to L.A. and there's a tremendous market in L.A. And I think also the team, the the team and the foundation of the group of people put together to do this deal. And you know, we strategically were putting together our group. You know, we were thinking about not just the team itself, but how we would operate the team and who we would bring in to be our partners. And I think that's a credit to Guggenheim and to Stan Kasten and as they, as they thought this through. I mean, Stan Kasten is arguably the best or one of the best operators in the business. Uh, Magic Johnson and what he brings to the table, his charisma, his personality, his, his, his ability to uh, excite people, his passion, and, and he knows that market so well. Peter Gruber and everything he brings, and of course Guggenheim. I mean, so I think it was a team, and we thought. I think my client, when they looked at the entire picture, they looked at the media transaction, they looked at the settlement agreement between Major League Baseball and and Mr. McCourt. We spent a lot of time thinking that through, and then we developed a team of people that really, the, and they developed a team of people. I should say that I think they believe they can build a model around that that makes sense. This deal actually happened quickly when you look at the typical length of time between when a baseball team owner looks to sell the team and the deal closes. I mean, he announced, I think, November 1st, 2011, that the team was going to be for sale, and it closed by the end of March. What type of experience was that for you and your team? It was tremendous. I mean, when Mr. McCourt actually um, filed for bankruptcy, no one knew what the process was going to be and whether or not he would sell. And as November rolled around and a settlement agreement was reached and it was announced that he was going to sell, things started to pick up pace and the pace just kept on you know, picking up faster and faster and faster. Next thing you know, diligence materials coming out in December. We're running through documents, we're running through a process, putting bids together. It, it was cr tremendously quick in the end, uh, with, but in spurts. And so we would work really quickly. Take, you know, there'd be a, a week to figure out where things stood, then back again. Um, our goal at a certain point is you want to stay in the game. You, know, you want to stay in the game and be competitive. As, you never know what could happen in these deals. This is not the first uh, large transaction in sports my group has worked on, my team has worked on. So what we kept on thinking to ourselves is do what we need to do to, to, to be competitive, remain in the process, and put ourselves in a position to succeed. And that means hustling and hustling throughout. And when we hit March and we knew we were in the Final Four, uh, it was a very exciting time. And it could go to anyone at that point, but we were in a position to make the move. And when we did make the move and we did step up and when my client uh, chose to, to become the buyer of the Los Angeles Dodgers from March 27th to May 1st, April 30th was an insane pace. My guys were working, the last two weeks we were working 22 hours a day in a conference room in Los Angeles, um, barely eating and uh, trying to enjoy the moment, but you really, but really it's stressful and you're working through Major League Baseball's process and you know, they have a process to run and you have to be respectful. They are the governing body and the regulatory body that we have to work through and we have our issues and concerns and the courts had their concerns and it was a non-stop event. Um, so it was, it was challenging. I will say at the end it was pretty emotional. Did you feel completely drained and exhausted when it was finished? Drained, exhausted, and yet excited. And to be a part of the largest transa sports transaction in the history of sports it's something special. It's something my team is proud of. My firm is proud of. Um, and I really did. We really were emotional. I, I gave a. We had a little. It, it was really hard. I mean, the last day we're we're, we're in this office and you're, you're sweating it out and trying to solve problems and documents are signed and wires are wires are flying everywhere and everything's happening and you're like, we just did this. Now, as everyone leaves and the pop and circumstances done, we actually have to continue to work because there's post closing items to resolve, but. But we took a minute to, to basically, uh, uh, you know, go around the room to some of the team members that were with me and just ask them, you know, what they thought and how they felt. And for me, it was pretty moving. Um, it's hard to imagine. We had 60 people working on this around the clock. How was this deal, the fact that it was in bankruptcy going on, uh, how did it shape the negotiations and the sale process? 
Well, we had to be, you know, one thing that was unique is that we had to be respectful. We always have to be respectful of bankruptcy court. And that, that's a process, you know, you have, usually it's baseball and, and the team and the buyer. In this instance, you had another party. And, and not only did you have the judge, you also have a mediator. And so you had to be respectful. You had multiple parties to be respectful of um, to try to process. I, I think what, what was really unique, though, is the timing. You know, from, when we did Texas or Chicago or, you know, D.C., there's a little bit more time to get through the regulatory process and work through issues. We had a very short, uh, you know, window to get things done. And I think it was challenging for the league and it was challenging for the buyer and challenging for the seller. It created a lot of tension, but we had to, you know, we had to push through. The settlement agreement said the deal had to close by mm -hmm. April 30th and we were, you know, we had to push to make that happen. And I, I think that was one of, one of, one of many challenges we, we all faced. Well, I was going to say, you know, if this will help, you know, one of the things that had been happening uh, or has been happening in the last few months is the media rights landscape for baseball has really changed and the values of the rights deals have, has escalated. I mean, talk about the Astros, they got a $3.2 billion, they're part of an RSN with the Rockets and Comcast. Uh, the Rangers, you worked on that deal with Nolan Ryan's group in securing his purchase of the team. They got a uh, big TV deal, local cable deal. The explosion in rights fees was sort of happening as you're going through this process. I remember people starting uh, before the sale process began were saying 1.5, 1.7 billion for a new TV deal for the Dodgers. Now people are saying, well, you know, by the time uh, this rights deal is closed, we're talking three billion, three and a half billion. What was it like going through this very tense purchase of a team or trying to buy a team at the same time, the whole dynamics of the media markets changing? Well, it was part of the diligence process, and our, you know, our, our bankers and our, the were really looking through that carefully. We were looking through it carefully, of course, on the legal side. It, clearly, the landscape has been changing and continues to evolve, especially in that market. What's happened in LA is very interesting with the Lakers and the Clippers, and or not yet with the Clippers, but the Lakers and, and the Angels. So it's a very competitive market, uh, and it's a very large market. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure anyone knows exactly where that's going to land, but I think it's going to continue to grow and it's going to continue to evolve. And I think that was you know, part of the part of the challenge in valuing what you thought that, what one would think the franchise was worth. Um, it, but it was just one of the factors, one of several. But it was. One of the, it's a, an, an important factor. Um, but the media market is, it, it's not slowing, it doesn't appear to be slowing down right now. One of the biggest factors, and in my opinion, uh, on equal footing with the media rights deal, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but the agreement that McCourt had with Major League Baseball uh, about the sale of the team and the fact that he's controlling the sale process as opposed to Major League Baseball, at the end of the day, did that make your job harder or easier in terms of being able to place a value on the Dodgers? Well, usually a seller does control the process uh, to a certain extent. So that, that aspect of it wasn't the most unique. It was the fact that you know, combining it, in the, that it was in bankruptcy and their baseball rules, part of that, that, that's where I think created some unique, unique dynamics there. Um, Mr. McCourt's analysis or our analysis of valuation, it, didn't, it was not impacted by whether baseball was running it, the, the sale process or Mr. McCourt was running the sale process. For us, it was based on facts, information we can gather on the franchise and what we believe the, the future of the franchise would be. Um, yeah, so whether it was baseball or Mr. McCourt, that, wasn't, that was running the process, that wasn't really impacting our valuation. Um, what I think, uh, what what happened in their settlement agreement is I think the settlement agreement created some conditions that we had to work through and um, that created different challenges for us. And maybe not so much on the valuation, although possibly on valuation as well. Um, that's where we had to, I mean, understanding that settlement agreement was incredibly important to us. And that we put a value on understanding that, what, what that settlement agreement meant. Did you actually get to see the settlement agreement early on? Because I know at one point it was you know, sealed in court, or was it just something you were allowed to hear certain information about? We were able to read the settlement agreement, and there are some terms that are sealed. The, the, the general settlement agreement was, was available, but there was a portion of the settlement agreement that was sealed, and we were permitted to see, see those. As, as lead counsel, I was permitted to see that it was a very limited uh, group 
um, that was able to see the, what was termed the special terms. And we reviewed them very carefully, um, discussed them at length, thought about them constantly. Uh, it was very important. I mean, this sale process was interesting for lots of different reasons. I mean, baseball, for the first time, approved multiple potential owners. And, and that's not something baseball has ever done before. Um, I'm, I'm not sure you know, why they did it or why they chose to do it. It, it. They did. That's the process they established. I was in the room in the negotiations. You know, I think baseball achieved their objective, they, they, which was they wanted a change of ownership. They accomplished their objective. We accomplished our objective and won the franchise.